Awesome. So hi, everyone. I'm Rishabh. And this is joint work with Sumit Gulwani, also from Microsoft Research. And I'll be presenting to you this system called SEMFIL that performs semantic transformations inside Excel. Uh, as you all know, there's too much data right now in this world. And, uh, and a, lot, a lot of that data actually lies in spreadsheets. And this is one, just one small example where you can see this spreadsheet has dates in many different formats. And the reason actually this big data mess um, inside spreadsheet is typically a lot of data is coming from multiple sources, so they are typically in multiple different formats. And a lot of data is also coming from the web that has a lot of different attributes to the data. And several studies have shown that a lot of time uh, of data, data scientists who work with such data, about 80% of their time is spent in just cleaning up this data, um, and re remaining 20% is actually doing the useful analysis on top of it. On top of that, uh, there's a large class of people um, who use Excel every day, who don't even have programming expertise of these data scientists. So writing macros or VB scripts is beyond their capabilities. The only uh, mechanism they currently have is they, they go to online forums and ask the question that I have data like this in my spreadsheet. Uh, I want to clean it up. I want to transform it. And here's one example. Then on the forums, there's typically a lot of experts. They go in and say, uh, from, for this example, this is one possible macro or VB script you can use to transform the data. And the user takes that macro, applies it to the spreadsheet, and finds it works on a lot of data, but some data it doesn't work. So they can give more, more examples. And finally, after a few iterations that spends uh, typically a few hours or sometimes even days, they get the final result. And then they are happy about it. So, uh, so similar to this work, some time back we worked on this system called FlashFill that was aimed at making this process of doing data transformation easy uh, using syntactic string transformations. And actually, it's, it's been quite, uh, uh, quite popular. We've been getting a lot of good feedback from users using this system. And actually, just two days back, a friend sent me an article that said, uh, recently was published two days back, that said seven useful tricks that you might not know that might impress your boss. And number one on that list was flash fill. Uh, but the problem is, let's say somebody reads this article and wants to impress their boss. They start using flash fill. Very soon they will realize that, yeah, there are a lot of restrictions or limitations with using syntactic transformations. Uh, more precisely, there's a lot of data in spreadsheets that are not just arbitrary strings. These strings actually mean something. They have some semantic meaning associated with them. For example, here, there are a list of dates, or we have a list of names, list of phone numbers. So all these strings are not just syntactic strings. They have some semantics associated with it. And they want to clean such data, which Flash, uh, which Flashfill has no information about. Moreover, actually, this, is, this problem of data cleaning uh, semantic uh, data types is not just limited to spreadsheets. Uh, we looked at many forums, programming forums like Stack Overflow, where developers also have this problem, uh, where they say, I have data in all these formats, and can you help me write some regular expression script or some kind of uh, programming script to uh, clean my data? The three main challenges in working with such uh, data types, first of all, it's non-uniform. So by non-uniform, I mean there are multiple different uh, formats for these data types. For example, here you can see I have dates in three different formats, European, uh, American, and Chinese. Second, these are unstructured uh, a lot of times. For, uh, by unstructured, I mean there's no regular expression to simply find the pattern or learn the pattern of this data. Uh, I'll give you a few examples of that as well. And finally, a lot of times, these data types are ambiguous. For example, if you look at row five, uh, it's hard to, uh, hard to actually assign any meaning to this, uh, a precise meaning, because it's not clear six can be a day, or six can also be a month. So these three char characteristics actually make, uh, uh, make this problem a lot more challenging than just the syntactic transformations. To handle, uh, to solve these challenges, actually, most of the work uh, in this area of data cleaning using synthesis has focused on learning deterministic programs. But 
to handle such kind of challenges, we have to go to uh, this setting where instead of learning deterministic programs, we are learning programs that have probabilistic semantics. And once we do that, actually we get some extra benefits as well. Uh, we can also handle cases where there's missing data or there's some noise in the examples that user have provided. So now let me show you briefly how the SEMFIL system actually handles these cases. Cursor is. Oh, good. So this is the same example I was showing you before. This is taken from an Excel help forum where date, date is in three different formats. And I want to actually transform it to some consistent format to do my query. Let's say I want to transform them to date dash month, uh, month dash day dash year format. So here in the system, I give an example. Then system uh, learns a program to transform these data types. And as, as you can see, in this case, actually just one example was enough to learn the correct transformation. Um, and interestingly enough, dates like row five, which were ambiguous, uh, system actually uh, understands that seven is a month and six is a day. Uh, we can do any kind of transformations here, we can say, uh, maybe somebody wants to transform it like this. And then system would learn a program to actually do that particular transformation because system knows what, actually eight, is, eight can also be, in, uh, be a string called August. Uh, so here is an example take, uh, from the Excel team actually. Uh, one of the uh, customers surveys had this spreadsheet where uh, this has dates in multiple different formats, actually. And uh, they had to write about 50 lines of VB script just to even parse few of them, these formats, and understand them. But in this system, since actually, uh, and this is an example of unstructured data. There's no logical way to, no logical, uh, regular expressions way to capture this data. Uh, but the user wanted to transform it to this form, month followed by year. And actually, just by one example, it does a pretty good job. Most of these are as desired. Um, let's see, in this case, actually, it gets it wrong. Uh, in this case, as well. So here, we can give another example. We can say, instead of January, I want April here. And now the system has two examples, and it will learn a program to uh, refine other inputs that are similar to that as well. So here's another name example, and this is actually quite common we found in spreadsheets where names are in multiple different formats. Some names have middle names, some names have title in front of them, some names have degrees at the end, and actually you want to format them in consistent manner. Uh, for example, I want to format them as uh, last name followed by first name dot. And again, uh, uh, since system knows about names, it's able to interpret that as what is a first name, last name, and do some syntactic transformations on top of it. Finally, uh, let me show you an example where uh, there's some noise in the data. So here the input column has all dates in nice format, consistent format, but my specification, if you'll notice the examples, uh, my, I, what I want to do is I want to write month followed by day, but first of all, in line number two, there's a spelling mistake here. Instead of writing February, there's missing R. And so this is an example of noisy, noisy output. And in row three, actually, I've given an inconsistent output. So I've given day before month. And the idea is if you give enough correct examples, the system will be able to actually still learn the correct program and moreover, fix the erroneous input as well. Yeah, okay, so this is actually what I wanted to showcase. Demo. All right, so now actually let me briefly now talk about how uh, behind the scenes system is uh, handling all these cases. So the first part of system is actually we want users, there are two kinds of users. One is just the end Excel users who want to use the system. They just give examples. 
The other kinds of users are we want to make it easy for people to add their own data types. So we, we allow uh, a way for these data type designers to declaratively specify these domains. Uh, so essentially, these data types have few uh, properties. First of all, they are defined using a set of fields. For example, a date would have day, month, year, day of week. Each one of these fields would be associated with a set of subfields. Uh, for example, the day, uh, we can have day in one digit or two digit dates, or maybe first, second, third, that format. So these are a set of regular expressions that define various ways in which that particular subfield can be uh, formatted. And we also have some likelihood values saying how likely it is that the initial field in this particular data type is going to be a particular field. What is the likelihood that field F1 would be followed by field F2? And what is the likelihood that a field F would uh, be present in a particular subfield, let's say FS? So once we have these data type descriptions, we then have format descriptors that assign meaning to these data type strings. And these are simply a list of field delimiter pairs. For example, if I have a string like this, 04 slash 05 slash 08, and I have a format descriptor that says uh, delta zero is epsilon, uh, first field is D, D2, particular subfield, then M2, then Y1. Given this format descriptor, we can instantiate this string to a particular date instance that assigns uh, corresponding day, month, year values. These format descriptors, in addition to parsing, can also be used for printing or formatting. So given a date instance like this, where we have 5, 8, 2011, and a format descriptor. Uh, so, so in this case, actually, if you notice, the first field is M3. Uh, so M3 field is supposed to be a string field. So string field, we can have optional parameters that say, uh, length of the prefix, how much we want to print, and in which case. So in this case, it says I want to print the month field first three characters in proper case. So given this uh, format descriptor, that particular date instance would be uh, printed like this. So given a format descriptor, we can also compute its weight, which is simply multiplying uh, the likelihood of the initial field followed by field orders, and how likely is it a field is sub, uh, going to be in a particular subfield. So this way we can compute the weights of the uh, format descriptors. And we have a procedure that given a date string, we can efficiently compute all its, in, uh, all its weighted instantiations, uh, its instance value and the format descriptor values using a DAG-based representation quite efficiently. Yeah, so this was the first component where we have a declarative way to specify a data type uh, with certain functions, and then we get this parser system for free that gives us all possible weighted instances of that particular data type. Next, uh, we want to do transformations on these data type uh, strings. So we have a transformation language. And we'll start with this very simple base language that is essentially a sequence of case statements that says, if I see an input in format descriptor uh, in one format, I want to format it using some other format descriptor. So it's a sequence of case statements. Um, so this, uh, we'll call this base language, and it has several issues. First of all, as you can see, if I have non-uniform data, that means I'm gonna have multiple, uh, multiple ways to parse different inputs, multiple format descriptors. Here, actually, I would, I would have to specify one input per format. That's one issue. Second issue is if I have, let's say, ambiguous inputs where I have multiple pass descriptors. Uh, so when I run this program, there are going to be multiple branches that would be executed, and it's not clear what to do with the output. Should I pick the first one? Should I pick the last one? Uh, yeah, so, so we, we don't have any meaning here of what happens when there are multiple outputs. So to rectify this, in our domain-specific language, what we're going to do, we are going to first of all have this notion of weighted branches. So we're going to have a language, as we saw before, base language, but we're going to assign a weight to each branch. 
we call that reformat expression that takes an input format descriptor, the output format descriptor, and a weight. Then in the case statements, instead of doing Boolean matching, we are going to perform approximate matching. And I'll, I'll give you the semantics afterwards. But the idea here is that even if I have not seen an input a format before, I should be able to do my best job given whatever I know till now. Finally, uh, we have the notion of joint learning where the set of reformat expressions also have a dictionary of parses with them. And the idea here is that if I have a lot of spreadsheet data, can I learn from other inputs some information uh, about uh, what, uh, are more, what parts are more likely than the other parses? So now actually, let, so, I, so those were just the three main concepts in the language. Now let me define what they actually mean uh, in terms of semantics. And here we're going to borrow ideas from the work on random interpretation. So, so, so in that case, actually we have four kinds of nodes in our language. First of all, we have one-to-one -one node. Uh, so on the left, we have deterministic semantics. On the right, we'll have probabilistic semantics. So typically with one-to-one -one function in normal deterministic semantic, we get a state. We apply the function, we get another state, f of s. In probabilistic semantics, uh, we have a set of weighted states. And when we apply the function, we get another set of weighted states where the weights remain the same, but the states are correspondingly transformed. So that's one-to-one -one function. Next, we have one-to-many functions, which in deterministic case actually leads us to false or bottom. There's no state after applying the function. But in that, uh, in the deterministic, uh, in the probabilistic case, we have a set of weighted state. When we apply the one-to-many function g, we get another set of weighted states where the idea is we apply function g to each one of the individual state and we get corresponding states, uh, corresponding set of states, and we just do a union of all of them. Then we have a switch node. In, in deterministic case, what happens is if I have, let's say, b branches, and my state matches branch i. For that particular branch, I'll get state s. For all the other branches, I'll get bottom. In the probabilistic case, uh, we are going to, uh, we have a set of weighted states and set of branches. We'll get a corresponding set of branches for each, uh, corresponding set of weighted states for each of the branch, where uh, the interesting thing is going to be how do you compute the weight of each of the branch. And the way we compute is it is by multiplying weight of the branch with the weight of the initial state, and then how well the state matches a predicate pi. So it has these three components uh, in computing the final weight uh, of the state. And finally, the last node kind of node is a join node, where in deterministic case, I have set of bottoms and a set of, uh, and a state s. When I join, I get a single state s. In this case, I have a set of weighted states. When I do a join, I'll, I'll get another set of weighted states, but the way I get states here is I look at all the states, I do a union and remove all the duplicates, and to compute the weight for each state, we go over all, this, all the states in our, in, in our uh, input set of states and find the weight that is maximum amongst the state that have the same state value. So these are the four kind of nodes that we have in random interpretation. And now let's go back to the program I was showing you before in our transformation language. We have a dictionary followed by a set of reformat expressions. What does it mean to run an input on this program? So we get an input string s, first of all, and I want to run this program on this string. So first of all, we use this function, get all parses, which is like a one-to-many functions, a one-to-many function node that will give us a set of weighted uh, data type instances. We then run this, uh, the switch node which, where we have a set of um, predicate branches. And the semantics are similar to the switch node here. We get, for each branch, we get a set of weighted states where weight is again computed in a similar fashion. Then we apply the format function, which is one-to-one -one function that transforms these data type instances into corresponding output strings. And finally, we have the join node that 
takes all these output strings uh, and unions them and find the maximum weight for each output. So now at the end, given an input string, we get a set of output strings that have some weights associated with them. And we, and, and, and we can present the user multiple strings or the top ranked string depending on the interface that we expose. Now briefly, let me tell you the key ideas. Uh, so this language was about representing the programs, but we don't want users to write these programs. We want to learn them. Uh, so here are some interest, key ideas in the synthesis algorithm part. How do, how do we learn such programs? So given one input output example, we compute, first of all, we compute the set of all parses for the input string and the output string. Um, and then we consider the cross product of set of format descriptors for the two strings. Um, and a very high level view, what we do, we look at the fields present in the output string and we check if those fields have the same value in the input string uh, using this function called equal. And this is something that can also be, it doesn't have to be exactly equal. Uh, user, a data type designer can define what it means for two fields to be equal. And in the paper, actually, you'll also find more details on how to handle missing fields, uh, how to handle missing fields in the output data. Uh, but if, if this condition is true, then we add this as a possible program in the set of programs. We say pi input and pi output are uh, a possible way to transform the input string to the output string. Uh, so this was for one example, but let's say I have a set of examples with me. Uh, so what we do, first of all, we learn dictionary uh, and dictionary computation is simply you take all the input strings, you compute the parses, uh, compute the frequency, and then normalize the weights. Uh, and the idea is you want to compute how, like, uh, how frequently a certain par uh, parse descriptor occurs in my data set. Then we, for each input, we learn the set of reformat expressions. And finally, this is the most interesting part. So most of the previous work, um, for example, flash fill, what it does, it learns the set of programs for each example and then intersects them to find the common set of programs. Uh, here we can't do it because if we intersect two things and if they're noisy, we'll get empty. So instead of that, we actually take a weighted union of these programs and the, and the idea here is that if certain programs occur more frequently, they're, they're going to have more weight and the, and the noisy programs are going to go down. Over, uh, with more and more examples. And then we just return the pr learned program. If we actually, um, if we do the weight normalization and computation properly, we can show that the algorithm is actually sound for noise, non-noisy and consistent data. And what do I mean by the soundness result? It means that whatever examples user have given, the learned program would always return the user output as the top result on the inputs for which the examples are provided. And we also have a completeness result saying, if there exists a reformat program in our language over uh, a restricted class of format descriptors, we are guaranteed to learn that program given enough examples. So quickly, uh, the evaluation of this system. We took around 55 benchmarks, uh, both from the Excel team and the online help forums. A lot of them were actually dates, yeah, because that's the most common uh, data type uh, people ask questions about and what Excel team is also interested in. But we also have a few examples from other domains like names, phone numbers, units, currencies. So here um, uh, is just a, uh, a graph about how many, uh, so SEMFIL can actually handle all of the 40 benchmarks in the date domain. And other flash fill techniques can handle up to 10 to 11 benchmarks. And the base language actually already can handle 25 of them. But, and it can actually learn quite quickly in a few milliseconds. But here's the problem with base language. So this graph is showing you how many examples are needed to learn the desired programs. And as you can see, base language requires quite a lot of programs, a lot of inputs to learn the transformation. If we add weighted branches to the base language, the number of examples needed are already quite few. We only need, on average, 2.2 benchmarks. With approximate matching, we need about 
and with joint learning we need about 1.5. So these averages are actually not the right way to think about ranking. It's more about how many benchmarks can we do with just one example. And uh, if we'll see actually joint learning, uh, about 89% of the benchmarks we can do with just one example. Um, so finally, actually, one issue that we have, since we have to compute the dictionary of all parses, if we have a very large spreadsheet, it might take a lot of time. Uh, so here's just an experiment showing if you have how, how the uh, scalability of SEMFIL, uh, how scalable SEMFIL is with larger and larger spreadsheets. Uh, as you can see, as soon as we go to around 20,000 uh, strings in the spreadsheet, it takes about 20 seconds. But the nice thing is um, we don't have to actually compute dictionary over all of my inputs. I can take a uniform sample with the hope that it's a representative set. Um, and the idea of learning dictionary is just about disambiguating ambiguous parses. And typically, if you get 100 of them, uh, that's more, more than en enough to actually do a good job at disambiguation. Yeah, so, so just to summarize, uh, now actually we are extending this uh, system of semantic transformations to also be able to do syntactic transformations like flash fill. Um, currently, the likelihood values were mostly, about, uh, mostly in, in terms of declarative constraints, saying it's more likely that first name is followed by middle name or last name, uh, but they are given manually. Uh, now we are using uh, millions of web tables that Excel team has scraped. Uh, to be able to actually learn this from data, these uh, likelihood values. And another restriction right now is that we can only have one data type string in a column, but we are also extending it to support multiple data type strings. So in conclusion, I showed you the system that performs semantic transformations from examples where the DSL has probabilistic sem semantics. Um, and the key idea here is to combine uh, the inductive synthesis approaches with the work on random interpretation to be able to handle non-uniform, unstructured, and ambiguous data. So thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I can answer afterwards. Thanks. <laughs>